teacher this evening. And Dr. Austin and myself will do our best to make sure that the dean gets a chance to um, address that. So without further ado, Dr. Um, Dr. Sneed, I'll allow you to address the, the audience. Just one second, yeah. Dr. Sneed. Okay. That was that I said before we go um, to, uh, to Dr. Sneed, we have uh, two people from the Florida Conference of the United Methodist Church um, who will be speaking for just just a moment, and we have, uh, we're going to start with Reverend Dr. Sharon Austin, who's a member of the Bishop's Extended Cabinet and Director of Connectional and Justice Ministries, and then she will pass off to Reverend Valerie Goddard, who's the pastor of Keeney Chapel United Methodist Church, and she is also a member of the Moffitt Center. Thank you very much, Dr. Austin. I appreciate it. Um, we are going to figure out the um, family connection at a yes. later time. So we are two Dr. Austins on the uh, call this evening. Uh, let me extend to you uh, a warm word of welcome uh, and our gratitude for the opportunity we have this evening. On behalf of our Bishop Ken Carter, I want to welcome all of the members of the Florida Conference and other friends and partners uh, for an evening of enlightenment uh, and education. I also want to express gratitude to Gulf Central District Superintendent, Dr. Candace Lewis, uh, and to our Director of uh, Missional Engagement, the Reverend Clark Campbell Evans, for their input and leadership. I want to express thanks to the staff of the Florida Conference who assisted with the logistics of uh, this event. And I want you to know that the Florida Conference has been uh, engaged in the journey of equity and justice around healthcare concerns uh, since the Andra Salemi, and she last year entitled The Color of Coronavirus, specifically designed for pastors to use with congregations of color uh, to some of the myths and to make the information more palatable. So we want to on this journey for a while, and we're grateful now to partner with you tonight. Uh, last but not least, I want to thank Pastor Valerie Goddard. She uh, is a leader in her own right. She serves at Keeney United Methodist Church with distinction, and she brings Altman as a member of the uh, Moffitt uh, Board of Directors uh, to the opportunity for tonight. And so with that, I turn it over to uh, Pastor Goddard. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Austin, and certainly to Dr. Hill and Dr. Austin. It's just an honor to have you all to be with us tonight. And uh, we're just delighted to have the opportunity to share uh, this amazing information that Dr. Sneed will with uh, all of the Florida Conference participants. Just briefly, I just had to stop and just share just how this came about and why this is such a critical I don't think it's me. Dr. Goddard, you're, you're muted. Okay. Sometimes it goes in and out. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Thank you. So as I'll keep an eye on it so it doesn't click off. But technology is wonderful when it works, huh? <laughs> but we're just delighted. And I just wanted to let you all know that there was a call to action to have tonight's event. As a uh, board member for Moffitt, we are specifically focusing in many, many ways on health disparities, health disparities and the impact it's having on the African-American community with cancer. And so by looking at that data and being involved and seeing how families of, of communities of color are impacted every day, we could not, not address the impact of COVID. And so Dr. Green from Moffitt and I, he set up a meeting with Dr. Sneed. I said, we need to get this information out to our community. And so when we had that meeting, Dr. Sneed shared his information and it was so compelling. And his last words to me were, Pastor Goddard, Ms. Goddard, the great work that we're doing 
we can do even more if we come together. This is life-changing information that I want to be sure we get to our community. So I took on the challenge and I said, I am going to do my very best to connect uh, various entities and organizations to be sure that we get this information to our community. And so and that so led me to reach out to Dr. Austin and Dr. Lewis and then to Dr. Deborah Austin. And everyone said, yes, Ms. Goddard, Pastor Goddard, we're in. And so in a matter of three weeks or less, we were able to pull this together and to mobilize to ensure that we are getting this vital and critical information to the Florida Conference and to the broader community. So I, my prayer tonight is that the information will be received and that it will be transformational in such a way that it moves us to action, personal action, and then to share it with our congregations and certainly to the broader community. And so without any further delay, I just want to thank each and every one of you for your, for your participation, certainly the Florida United Methodist Church, the conference and its leadership, and certainly for all of you all uh, for being a part of this, and Dr. Austin with Reach Up and uh, uni the university as well. Collaboration enables us to communicate and facilitate transform transformation in ways we have yet to realize. So I thank you all for your willingness to partner. And I believe this is just the beginning of greater efforts that we can collaborate on to impact lives of those in our communities. So thank you so much again. And so with that, uh, Dr. Hill, I'll turn it back to you so that we have the opportunity to be blessed by Dr. Sneak's presentation. Okay, well, we will go ahead. And as I mentioned, um, I am so pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Kevin Sneed, the Executive Director for We Care, the founding dean uh, for the Tanasia College of Pharmacy at uh, Florida, 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 Florida College of Pharmacy at Florida. Florida. Oh, I apologize. <laughs> and um, so, Dr. Sneed, I will allow you to take over at this point. With uh, Dr. Hill, thank you very much. Um, you know, after that very kind introduction, I, I I wish I had the money from the state to be able to give you a really big raise. I like but, uh, that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I just want to say uh, very much to both Dr. Austin and Dr. Austin for um you know, for for allowing me to share this evening and, and for Pastor God. I just want to thank you uh, just for your spirituality overall. Um, you, you know, it, it was a pleasure to meet you the first time and and um. And you saw the big smile I had when we saw each other this evening. So, uh, you know, it was very genuine. Uh, what I'm going to try and do th uh, this evening, oh, and before I go any further, just for a moment of levity, um, uh, I've, been, I've been in the clinic since 7.30ish morning, and I just left the clinic uh, probably about 45 minutes ago. So uh, I did not have the opportunity to uh, get up to the, to the, the uh, wardrobe standards of both Dr. Austin's and Pastor Goddard and Dr. Hill. Uh, so uh, please, please forgive me, but, but know that uh, wearing scrubs is, is, a, is a normal part of my day and, and, uh, and I'm very happy to be here with you, with you all this evening. Uh, what I hope to accomplish on uh, this evening really and truly, uh, we're gonna give a presentation in the beginning. Um, I'm gonna try and keep it to about 15 or 20 minutes. And then after that, I really just want to engage all of you with a discussion uh, I put in a few extra uh, things on this evening to try and spark a thought uh, for many of you and really try and get at the heart of, of where we are in this country right now from a healthcare standpoint overall, a health equity standpoint, where we are here in the state and how it all pertains directly to uh, this coronavirus that we're finding ourselves battling against. And so I'm going to share my screen here. And uh, Dr. Hill, I'm going to, once again, I, I try. I tried to fix my um, my one slide, but if it goes, if it if it doesn't work, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it back up, and we're gonna keep moving, okay? Okay. Okay, because um, I had to put that video back in. I love uh, the videos are a crowd pleaser. <laughs> we can see your slides. Okay, thank you very much, and take this and move this right here. Okay. So just here, just to kind of introduce who we are. Um, we care uh, stands for the right. work group okay. enhancing community advocacy and research. So just engagement. here, just to kind of introduce. And so just as a quick introduction, we have a video for you. To my 
do we care? Why do we care? Why this program? Uh, we want to improve health outcomes. The collaboration between USF Health's Tanasia College of Pharmacy's We Care program and Reach Up Incorporated aims to bridge the gap between underserved communities and access to care. We Care's mission is to increase the representation of diverse populations in clinical research. It starts with rebuilding trust between academic and clinical institutions through educating and empowering the community and then providing research opportunities along with protection and advocacy for the participants. They want to hear the story from folks who have been through a clinical trial. You have to share all of that information with everybody. The story. So take the opportunity to have a better quality of life in our communities. Join us. Okay, so let's talk about this coronavirus. Um, one of the questions I've lately been getting because of things you may find uh, occurring in the, new, in the news or the newspaper, are we going to be living with the coronavirus for a long time? And I'd like to share with all of you, we've been living with that family of viruses for a very, very long time already. We're just dealing with a particular strain or a particular uh, portion of it. Many of you in the past have had the common cold or the flu, and you may have thought it was caused by the influenza virus or a rhinovirus. But in reality, it may have actually already been a coronavirus, and it just wasn't that harmful to you, and it felt much like the common cold. Um, uh, we, we call what we're dealing with now SARS-CoV-2 because we had SARS-CoV-1 back in 2002. That was the original SARS. Now, believe it or not, that was actually a little bit more deadly than what we're dealing with now. Uh, it was about 8,100 people around the world that got it, and over um, 800 of them died. Um, and then we moved on from that to uh, the MERS that you may have heard about in, in 2012. And now we're dealing with COVID-19 in 2019. So, uh, and I'm going to share information with you in a moment to really talk about the, about how quickly a pandemic can come upon us and how it was really important for us to build brand new technology in order to uh, combat uh, these uh, terrible viruses. Uh, so I have a series of, of uh, short videos I'm going to share with you just to kind of give you a context of of the fact that, yes, we are dealing with the real virus. I want you all to see it. But in particular, I want you to pay attention to the internal uh, components um, uh, of the biology of this particular virus. These are what we call the red spikes or the spike protein that you hear so much on talk about. So that's just a quick animation, and I have a follow-up video to that in just a moment, but I really wanted to share with all of you, many people around the country are still grappling with the fact of whether or not the coronavirus and its COVID-19 really exist. But what you're looking at is actual microscopy, uh, electron microscopy photograph that was taken from an actual cell and is now infected with the coronavirus variants, is what we call them. And so when we're beginning to talk about millions and millions of copies of this particular virus going all throughout your body, I want to give you an example. The green portion that you're looking at here is a single cell in your body. 
Okay, so imagine the millions and billions of cells that we have in our body and the capability for this particular virus to uh, uh, replicate very rapidly and spread throughout many portions of the body. Now I've got one other video here and, and this kind of explains and narrates a little bit more about the virus and the importance of the risk by protein and how it gets into the body. Oh, I apologize. We've been having difficulty with that particular video. We might try it. We might try it one more time. I apologize for that. It's been it's been been kicking out my my um Okay, we're going to try this. We're going to try it one more time. If it doesn't work, we will just move on. In a world where millions of lives are under threat due to COVID-19, it is of vital importance to gain a better understanding of how the virus actually works in search of a cure. The surface of the virus particle is covered with approximately 100 spike proteins. They always come in groups of three in which the proteins are intertwined. Each individual protein consists of two parts, a globular head called S1 and a stalk-like structure called S2. One of the three heads is slightly bent, enabling it to connect to the so-called ACE2 receptor on a human cell. Once the connection between the virus and the receptor has been established, the human body activates the TMPRSS2 enzyme. This is a protein cutting enzyme that proceeds to cut off the head of the spike protein. This causes a change in the structure of the virus. The S2 protein now grows longer, penetrating the human cell. The protein then retracts again, bringing the membranes of the virus and the cell very close to one another. At this point, the virus can enter the cell through a process of endocytosis. It engulfs the cell with its membrane. The virus has successfully invaded the cell and can now start to multiply, ready to overrun the system. However, we have strong defense mechanisms that try to prevent this from happening at all costs. Scientists recently discovered how our antibodies react. It's actually a very simple process. Our antibodies bind to the spike head, or S1, thereby preventing it from connecting with the ACE2 receptor and stopping the virus from spreading. Understanding exactly how this process takes place is key to the rapid development of a vaccine making it an essential part of our ongoing fight against this global public health crisis. So, Dr. Hill, just as a, a quick check, you, you can still see me, correct? Oh, uh, well, I, what we're seeing right now is your slides, and okay. I see, I see okay. you as well. <laughs> okay, no problem, okay. So the most important thing I wanted to share with all of you, uh, number one, especially as we, as we begin to talk about the vaccine later on here, there's nothing more dangerous about the vaccine than you're going to find with the virus. And you just saw two videos that really tried to explain and show exactly what's happening inside of our body. Uh, what I really want to bring your attention to without going through the full cartoon here is that this little blue strand that's inside of, that, of the actual coronavirus and this RNA strand this is the really deadly part of the actual virus. And there's no part of any vaccine that we're actually gonna encounter uh, between now and any other vaccine that may come on the market anytime this year or in the future that will actually have that component of, 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 um, of RNA inserted into our body. And that particular virus is extremely dangerous. Now you saw the red spike proteins and let me just share with you, I want you to imagine just for a moment Velcro, and uh, a piece of Velcro and then your favorite wool sweater. And if you were to put that Velcro onto your favorite wool sweater and then try and take it apart, you know exactly what will happen. Well, I want you to think about the red spikes as being very much like the Velcro and that ACE2 receptor, which is all throughout our body. And I'll show you exactly where it is in our body in just a moment. And that's how it attaches on to various organs inside of our body. And when it gains entry into the cell, at that point, it begins to release that RNA 
and gather and begin to replicate and multiply inside of ourselves. So what we're looking at here, when I talked about the ACE2 receptor, we, we, we find all of the different organ systems in the body. And this is why the actual virus itself is so dangerous. Again, if you start here on the left, you begin to look at the heart and we have it in our heart. Now we have it in our intestinal tract, we have it in our lungs. And we don't have a lot of them in our lungs, but the lung capacity and the surface area of the lung is really large. And that's why we find many people having respiratory conditions leading to um, being placed in an ICU and having to go on uh, ventilators and, and such on, so on and so forth. And then kidney problems. And so here we begin to also show the effect that it can have on all the organ systems in the body. Again, this is why the particular virus is so dangerous. It can start and it can have a neurological problem. We've already talked about kidney and uh, GI problems. But then back in April of last year, uh, reports came out of Philadelphia that were really beginning to show that how it can, you know, this particular virus can promote clotting. The clotting has really became really dangerous for us. And then uh, shortly after that, we began to understand that this particular virus can cause a little bit more cardiac and heart damage than other viruses before it. Now, it's not uncommon to have to develop a myocarditis or inflammation of the heart tissue from a, from a, from a virus. Uh, that can happen. But typically, that will only happen in about 1% of people. Now, we're getting reports right now that anywhere from 22 to 35% of people that become infected with the COVID-19 virus are now having heart conditions. So, again, I wanted to kind of illustrate to everybody why this particular virus is so dangerous. And here, I just want to once again kind of show everybody how important it is to be able to develop all the antibodies, because when we develop antibodies and we have that antibody army waiting, we can actually prevent that Velcro sticking onto the ACE2 receptor all throughout the body, thus protecting the body from the virus being able to attach and replicate inside of your body. And that's why we don't want to wait for your body to try and build its own antibody system. We want to vaccinate people so you have an antibody army waiting in case you do come into contact with the actual virus. Now, the other part that really happens, especially for people of color uh, who have been dealing with uh, terrible, terrible health disparities for many, many decades now. And that when we talk about that, we're talking about access to care. So it's not uncommon to find a higher propensity of people in African-American and Latino backgrounds to have the medical conditions here I show you. To be diabetic, to have high blood pressure, to fall into the obesity or overweight category. And all of these actually uh, generate what we call a chronic condition. And these chronic conditions lead to further internal inflammation. If a person that has that condition and is not well controlled now comes into contact with the actual virus, what we're now talking about is additional inflammation building up inside of the body and thereby leading to further organ damage and then possibly leading to that person having to go into the hospital, into the ICU, or unfortunately, sometimes even death. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about the vaccines uh, specifically because many people have a lot of questions about them. Here you see in green, we have two of, of the vaccines you've heard the most about that are on the market right now under what we call an emergency use authorization from the FDA, uh, Moderna and uh, Pfizer Bio, uh, BioNTech. They have a technology called messenger RNA technology. Now you've been hearing a lot about that. I won't explain it too in depth right now, but if you have any questions during our q and I'll be more than happy to talk, uh, talk to you about that. We have another one that just submitted for review by the, by the committee that, that does re, uh, vaccine review for the FDA. And that's from Janssen or Janssen, as it's really called, and, or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. You've heard about that. They're using what we call an adenovector um, virus to actually um, generate and put the, the, uh, the messenger RNA into the body and thereby helping to build out an antibody system that way. Again, brand new technology, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Now, the question I get, uh, right before I came on with you all, I was talking to my patients. I was encouraging them to sign up for a vaccination project that we have going on this weekend coming up. And the number one question people want to know, what is it going to do to me? How will it make me feel? What will be the side effect? Well, here you, we're showing you both the Moderna and the Pfizer uh, side effect profile. Now, if you look on the far left, overwhelmingly, the number one thing that people feel overall is fatigue, followed by headache. 
Now, when people begin to feel that, we want to help everybody understand. It doesn't mean that anything is anyone is being infected. Yes, you feel bad. All the clinical trials indicate it may be a 24 to 36 hour period. But typically beyond that, most people don't have any, any additional side effects at all. Some people feel nausea and vomiting, and then a few people might, may, may feel chills. It doesn't mean you're getting sick. What it does mean, however, is that that particular uh, vaccine is now working for you. It's building up the antibody army, and that's what you're feeling. And that's the fatigue feeling you're having. That's the headache you may feel. But also, I'd like to point out, when you see a, a number like 62% or 51% or anything on here, it doesn't mean 100%. I've talked to people that had no side effects at all. I talked to a nurse today that, talk, that told me she had, you know, really bad side effects. And I said, yeah, but, you know, a day and a half later, how did you feel? She said, yeah, you're right. I didn't feel anything at all. So we just wanted to help dispel the fact that, you know, if you do get the vaccine and you may go through a 24-hour period where you don't feel very good, but beyond that, the protection you're going to get against a very deadly virus will be very important. So people really want to know a lot of mistrust has been generated. So, you know, it seems like it came about too quick. Well, let's go ahead and dispel a little bit about that. Uh, I want to uh, take you all back to about 2013. Now, I'll shorten the presentation and I have other slides where I show it. But uh, back in 2013, uh, company, companies all around the world, but really in particular here in the United States, began working on the messenger RNA platform. And then back in 2014, President Obama actually gave that company $150 million to further advance their technology. And the reason he did that, by the way, and you can see the $125 million that he gave here, the reason that he did it was because he had already dealt with two pandemics. We don't remember or recall that President Obama actually had to deal with two pandemics or during the time he was in office. First, the H1N1, and then Ebola over in Africa, in which he deployed a large number of people and took them over to Africa so that hopefully we would not have to deal with it here. Now, back in the speech that he gave to the NIH back in 2014, and you can see, and again, I don't want to get too in, too in depth in reading the entire thing, but he said, um, so that if and when a new strain of flu, like the Spanish flu, crops up five years from now or a decade from now, We've made the investment and we're further along to be able to catch it. And the whole idea behind that had been that we, we knew he knew back then that we could not wait a two or three year period to develop a brand new vaccine. If we indeed encounter another virus that would turn into a pandemic that could potentially be more deadly. And so the investment was started back in 2013. We did not wake up in April 1 of 2020 and go and walk into the kitchen and, and try and try and cook up a brand new vaccine. That's not what happened, everybody. We actually deployed technology to be a rapid response unit in the, in the event that we would need it. Another thing that people really probably are not aware of is the fact that from the very beginning, when they began developing the vaccines, we've had African American, Latino, and other oversight of the entire process. Here I show Leon McDougall. Uh, he's at Ohio State University and at the time was president of the National Medical Association. He and I have had the occasion to speak, and I can share with you that he shared with me all of the input and oversight they were having into the vaccine development. Many of you have actually heard that one of the lead people for Moderna that actually generated the vaccine, that, that produced it and, and, and made it from the very beginning, was an African-American scientist by the name of Kismikia Corbett. Dr. Corbett was the lead fellow that actually developed the vaccine. So we've had, uh, we've had you know, involvement from African-American, Latino, Asian, Indian. We've had an array of different people, but really that's not the most important part. They were really focused on the fact that they knew that one day we would need rapid deployment. We could not wait a two year period. Imagine if we had to wait two more years for a potential vaccine that could be life-saving today. Now the overall impact on the African-American community from the very beginning was uh, really bad. Here, you can see uh, African-American involvement was disproportionate from the very beginning. This article was published back in April of 2020 of last year. And no matter what state we looked at, African-Americans were, were disproportionately hit far more than any of our white or even at the time Hispanic counterparts. I have more information about that in a moment. 
I went back and I looked at it and I wrote an article and I said, you know, it, it's not, it wasn't unknown to us as to when, where, how, and why many of our African-American people were going to be very affected. At the time, up in the New York area, Detroit, and then New Orleans and Louisiana in particular. In these areas, when anytime you find people that have a higher level of cardiovascular conditions, as I mentioned earlier, high blood pressure, diabetes, overweight obesity, and other conditions, when they became infected, then we had a higher death rate in those particular areas. So here, uh, I'll show you data that was actually taken back in December, not that long ago. And at one point earlier in 2020, African Americans were dying at three times the rate of our white counterparts. And again, people began to ask and wonder, well, why did that happen? Well, it's not because there's anything unique about the melanin in our skin or being or anything genetic. It really had a lot to do with all of the social determinants of health that I've already mentioned. A lot of the, the chronic uh, problems in healthcare, access to healthcare, essential workers, congregate living, vertical living areas. Uh, it really, from the very beginning, we were having a very difficult time. Now, what I can share with you is that over time, that rate has uh, continued to come down. And I didn't have time, I apologize, I didn't have time to, to cite it appropriately the way you find here. But as of today, that rate has come down to now 1.5 times the death rate of our white counterparts. Now, that's beginning to happen because now we have a widespread pandemic inside of a pandemic. And the virus has gotten into uh, the upper Midwest. Uh, up into the South Dakota, North Dakota, Wyoming, Montana area, and it's spreading everywhere in the middle part of America where it had not been before. Initially, it had been really found in the more metropolitan areas. Now we've had it widespread all over. But we continue to find that our, um, our indigenous populations, our uh, native Indian populations, and our Hispanic and Latino populations continue to be disproportionately affected as well. And so to kind of wrap everything up here, uh, one thing that we have been encountering and has driven my passion, has driven the passion of uh, Dr. Austin, Dr. Hill, uh, Mr. Green, we like to call him Dr. Green on occasion, uh, is, is the fact that we, we you know, in the very beginning, uh, and, I, and I was on a national level uh, talking with people, we had two problems. Number one, we were really concerned that we weren't going to be able to get the vaccine to all of the people that we really wanted. And we really got and Dr. McDougall and, and the NMA, and they were talking to the FDA constantly, making sure that we could get the vaccine into the areas that wanted to have it. And then we knew that there would be another problem. We knew that people on the other end, once we got the vaccine there, they had to want to take it. And of course, you know, the mistrust and Tuskegee experiment and everything else we've talked about or you've heard about before, those are all good and valid reasons why people have mistrust. But now the vaccine is here. And what we have been finding by giving educational sessions like tonight and, 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 and doing a lot more education in the public now has many more people from many of our uh, communities of color wanting to get the vaccine. But here I'm showing you data from, um, uh, from right here in, in, in Florida. And, uh, the, and the data has changed um, uh, since uh, uh, this morning. I didn't update it this morning. But during this time period, we had 1.99 million people vaccinated completely in Florida. And at that time, only 99,575,000 African Americans. Okay, so almost 2 million people, and, and we had not reached 100,000 people. That was at 4.8% at that time. When I looked at Hillsborough County, uh, we fared a little bit better we had 92,000 people vaccinated overall, 58,000 were white, but only 5,790 were, were African-American. Now, you know, the Hispanic numbers are also low, much lower than I would have anticipated being here in Hillsborough County. So we have to make sure that we're bringing everybody from every community into the uh, conversation. And so now we are um, giving a conversation tonight and we're making sure that we're going to be advocating, number one, we want as many people vaccinated as possible. But number two, we want to make sure that we're having equitable distribution of that vaccine. 
And so I'm going to pause right there, but I want to kind of end right here to let people know that I personally have taken the vaccine. I wanted to show people um, the We Care team and Reach Up Incorporated together. We've been giving presentations since uh, May of 2020. And by this point, we probably have given um, close to 50 different presentations for the community just to make sure. And the number one question people would ask on Dr. Austin or Mr. Green, has Dr. Snee gotten the shot yet? Is he going to do it? And I wanted to tell them, yes, absolutely, I did it. Um, I'm asking you to do it, and I wanted to show them that I did it. And so I'm going to pause right there um, so that we can get to having a really robust uh, Q&A session tonight. Uh, but we really wanted to have a good conversation, number one, about the vaccine and educate people about the dangers of the vaccine, number one. Number two, I want to assure all of you, if you don't remember anything else I say tonight, there is nothing more dangerous about the vaccine than the actual virus. I have, uh, as Dr. Hill mentioned, I have a background in cell and molecular biology and virology and microbiology. And back in, in February of last year, I guess almost a year now, I knew immediately, I did not want any part of what we're dealing with right now. And I don't want anyone else to have to deal with it. Before we move on to the Q&A, I do have to say one quick thing for all of us here in the Tampa Bay area, go Bucks. <laughs> Go Tampa Bay. We're really happy about that that world championship. Uh, uh, you know, you, I mean, it's just a wonderful thing to be in. And, and, and Tampa Bay is really now hearing it called uh, here with the lightning, the Tampa Bay lightning. But I will, I, I will be remiss if I didn't tell you, I was really concerned about the celebration afterwards. Okay, and I know people want to celebrate, but the reason I bring it up is that uh, data has come out this week, published on February 4th, uh, published on February 4th, that the number one transmission rate is the age group between 20 and 49. Okay, 20 to 49. And so now I'm going to be having internal conversations here and from a policy standpoint, advocating that as we get more vaccines out, uh, we want to vaccinate our elderly, but we must find a way to shut down the transmission in that age group if we have any hope whatsoever of bringing the virus in, in control because if we don't stop the transmission, we can't stop the mutations. And it's very important to understand that. So I'm gonna pause right there, Dr. Hill. Uh, I'm gonna uh, let you drive, but thank you, uh, Pastor Goddard, Dr. Austin, and Dr. Austin. Thank you all for allowing me to share a very brief uh, presentation. And I'm here at your disposal to try and answer any question you may have. Well, thank you, Dr. Sneed. And just for a moment of pause, everybody. Wasn't it great? Wasn't that some wonderful information? So let's take a, a moment of pause, finger snaps, or you can use your reactions button. But I told you you were going to be in for a treat. And so now it's an opportunity for you to um, ask him questions. So again, we'd like to invite you to put any questions you have or comments uh, in the chat. And what Dr. Austin and I will do, we'll go back and forth, kind of answering the questions and, and as time permits, we'll see how many we can answer. Um, while we're waiting on a few questions and kind of coasting through, just wanted to comment that one of the things Dr. Sneed also really wants to emphasize is that as we are um, embracing the vaccination, and we've just been so excited about the enthusiasm that people have had in the community in regards to getting the vaccine, it is so important. We can't emphasize enough that you continue to follow the CDC guidelines, uh, whether you're vaccinated or not. We still have to do that. And that's going to be um, as important as getting vaccinated, um, making sure that we're doing all the things that the CDC is advocating. So. Um, Looking at the chat, we had a comment from Cynthia Smith in regards to her being the choir director at Sylvan Abbey um, United Methodist Church. And she said that they've not yet begun singing, you know, because caution is pretty much their mantra. And um, she had taken the time to take a course on contact tracing. And so she really was looking forward to tonight's information. And so I just wanted to to kind of uh, say thank you, uh, Ms. Smith, and hopefully that this has been helpful to you. And wow, that's impressive that you learned about contact tracing. 
Dr. Hill, we had some questions to come in through email okay. prior to this evening. So okay. I just wanted to bring those up. One of them, I think, actually fits perfectly with what you just talked about. The first question that we had to come in is with vaccines here, when and how should churches begin relaxing the current restrictions being used for indoor worship? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, and, and really a question that uh, Dr. Hill and I have been getting uh, from the very beginning. Um, the, the number one thing I'm going to tell you is that even though we have a vaccine um, and we have vaccines coming on the market, uh, we should not relax anything at all. And and I know that we want to, and I'm and, and I'm a believer myself heavily. I belong to St. James House of Prayer for now going on 22 years, and I want to, uh, but I want to let you all know. One of the ways that we really began to understand in the very beginning, let me back up. In the very beginning, we felt, oh, you know, be careful what you touch. You know, it's like the flu virus. Mm -hmm. Well, we learned very early on that the actual virus can be aerosolized, okay, and it can hang out in the atmosphere in, in enclosed areas for a very long time, anywhere from two to four hours, depending on that location and the way they move air or not move air. And the way we found that out was a church in Washington State, I believe. It may have been Washington State or Oregon. Washington and, State. Yep, and 60 people were, uh, were, were physically distanced away from each other at a choir practice, and 44 of them became infected very quickly. And multiple of them died uh, eventually after that. And that kind of really began to let us know and do more research in the area. So... Um, even though we're getting vaccinated, I think Dr. Hill said it beautifully, we have got to continue until we uh, are comfortable with a level of herd immunity. And we, we'll talk about that at term later. But until we get comfortable with that, we need to continue to wear a mask. We need to continue the physical distance. And we don't need to have the mindset that we're going to relax anything. Because right now, believe it or not, we, we still have only had about 15 to 20 percent of the entire population that we can really detect has actually come into contact and been infected by the virus. There's a lot more people out there that continue to be susceptible to having the virus come and infect them. And we want to vaccinate as many of them before they become infected as possible. And so um, yeah, no, no relaxation just yet. I, I, I'm apologizing for that because I know we want to do it. But you know, one thing that we really began talking about it, it would, be, have, uh, would be to have a rotating schedule of about 25% of your congregation coming into your sanctuary. Uh, that, that seems to have been widely accepted around the country. You can uh, distance out. People have an opportunity to come in. And I have uh, continued to encourage not having mass choir singing uh, during that time period, even with the mask on, because we don't want to put people at risk. Um, and, and again, I, I love the choirs and we love the singing part, but uh, the one thing I can, I can share with all of you this particular virus, is a, it, it will affect any human it can get its hands on, okay? Uh, and, and it will infect you in a church. It will infect you at a restaurant. It can infect you anywhere. It, will get, it, it can come into contact with you. So we have to be very careful. Dr. Sneed, you mentioned uh, some of that. There's a question in the chat right now that's uh, parallel to what you were just talking about. Um, and it has to do with the fact that um, Jennifer Hunter said, asked, would it be considered safe for a praise team or choral group to sing inside a sanctuary when they are masked and eight feet apart or more than 12 feet from each other? That they have, she said, in their church, good airflow exchange and PHI UV protection in their air conditioning. Yeah, you know, you know, people ask me about the uh, about the UV and the air conditioning units. Uh, that's not going to help because if you happen to be the one infected, and I showed you how you can really have millions of copies of that virus, and for any reason, if you have a mask and you know, um, it, it happens to me all the time. If I'm talking with the mask and it kind of it slides down, I have to keep pulling it back up and it slides down. And if that begins to happen, or if you have gaps on the side of your mask whatsoever. But now you're potentially having a situation where the virus can escape from, a, from an infected individual that may not know they're infected. So I don't want to discourage you. I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer tonight and, and tell you that you can't do it. But you have to understand that if indeed it does happen, uh, people are, are still going to be at risk. 
And if it's coming, if the virus is coming from an individual, it's going to be in the atmosphere to be able to infect people long before it has a chance to be filtered uh, in the air conditioning unit. And, and as I get that question quite often, uh, but, but we, we've already proven that um, uh, we can't get beyond having that, that, that virus up in the atmosphere of an enclosed room, even if it's a fairly large room. And by the way, that's why the restaurants are such dangerous locations. Uh, they've been dangerous. And, and young people continue to go there and they continue to get infected and they continue to spread and be and have a, asymptomatic spread. So uh, I think that's the best answer I can give right now. Oh, all right, Dr. Sneed, um, where could the folks here find Florida's COVID vaccination plan? Um, there's a concern <laughs> that, you know, yeah. uh, what the person says one page is ages 16 to 64 with underlying medical conditions and where do ages 16 to 64 without underlying medical conditions fall in the plan? So essentially, where can, where can we put our hands on Florida's COVID plan, vaccination uh, plan? I'm going, to give you all, I'm going to give you all two quick answers. I promise they're going to be very quick because I want to get to every question tonight. Uh, let me find this for you real quick. Uh, here we go. And I'm going to share, share a slide with you one more time. I'm going to share a slide because I'm... Um, because uh, this is going to be extremely important for people to really begin to understand a little bit more. Um, about how and or why we can't get the vaccine in the way that we want to. This was the original plan set forth by the National Academies of Medicine and adopted by uh, the CDC. And so you can you can look at phase one and then phase two and and, 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 and this was the original plan. So again, you can see the high risk uh, workers and first responders and then one uh, B of people with comorbid conditions or older people living in congregate living areas. Congregate living areas, okay, ALF, nursing home, and that kind of thing. And then we were going to move on to phase two. And, uh, and at that point, uh, critical, you know, essential workers is what they were calling them. I've been a big advocate for teachers. So let me, let me stop. Let me stop that. And then I'm going to bring your attention to what we're really dealing with here. And and I'm here to work with, with any and everybody. We have an executive order. So I wanted to show you all the actual executive order. Um, this is uh, from the executive order from the governor from the state of Florida. And so they took that modification and they changed it. And they said long-term care facility residents and staff, anyone over the age of 65, healthcare workers, and then it says here, and this has really been tripping us up a great deal, hospital providers, however, also may vaccinate pe uh, people who they deem to be extremely vulnerable to COVID-19. And so that's the executive order, and that's the order that we are now bound to have to follow. And so I don't have an answer for that because, you know, right now, the original plan is no longer being followed. Had we not gone to the executive order, more than likely, we probably would have been moving on to the next group by now because all of our ALS and all of our um, our nursing homes, they've been covered. If you recall, uh, CVS and Walgreens, uh, they went out and they tried to vaccinate as many people in those areas as they could. Um, we don't have an answer right now, and it's really going to be contingent upon having more vaccine come onto the market but every governor of every state has control of how they're going to distribute that at vaccine. And we, our governor, but I, I want to be very clear <laughs> again, no politics here. I want to be very clear. It is. Uh, it's really hard to argue against what our governor did because the, the data at the time did support that they were um, people above 65 were 10% of all of the people infected, but 40% of the deaths that were occurring. And, and when you're looking at that, you know, you have to go in and try and get to the heart of a problem. But now looking at very similar data, I'm going to begin advocating that now we need to begin shifting to the 20 to 49 age group and probably the 25 
the 34 age group even more to try and shut down transmission. So that's the best answer I can give right now. But I wanted to show that to you about the executive order and how it departed away from the original plan. And now that we are here in Florida, we are we will be bound to follow the governor's plan. And that's what we're going to do as health care providers. All right. Thank you, Dr. Z. Just two more that are ministry related. Um, one has to do with what would, would be the expert advice for youth mission trips or travel for the upcoming summer. And then additionally, uh, are there any protocols other than the CDC guidelines for children's ministries? So one, what about youth mission trips? So I would imagine other mission trips and travel that churches might do for ministry. Um, particularly for this upcoming summer when they typically do that. And what about children's ministries? Well, um, this is going to be a little bit controversial for many of you to hear, but I'm going to, I can only talk about the data that have been looked at and peer reviewed. Okay. It does appear right now when people have looked at it, not only here in our country, but around the world. Okay. We're looking at worldwide data um, that, that children and, and, and our school age children, uh, they really did not transmit the virus as, as much as we had feared. Now they can contract it and they can become ill from it, but they're not actually transmitting to each other nearly at the rate that the rest of our population is. And they're not having really the, uh, many of the outcomes. And so right now you do kind of hear a little bit of a, a difference between our new uh, CDC director telling people, you know, we can open up the schools but, you know, the, the current White House um, saying, well, no, we, we're not in favor because we want to provide more protection. And I get and I understand both arguments, but the actual data on children. Now, it depends on the, the, the children you're talking about, um, because as you get older, as you get into the mid to late teens, that receptor in the body I talked about, it begins to mature a little bit more. It becomes a little bit more active in the cardiovascular system. Young children have it, but it's not nearly as active. And so um, I think a recommendation would be, number one, uh, you know, try to limit the number of people that would, that would travel, um, it, you know, or, or keep them apart. And number two, uh, we do not have anything specific to children's ministries beyond the CDC guideline for children at the moment. Um, so we have to kind of, kind of weigh uh, how are we going to deal with all of our children and their safety, but their capability of potentially bringing the virus back home to either their parents or even their grandparents. And so um, I know that's a, a bit of a hedge of an answer, but right now the data really is indicating that they probably are not spreading. And, and I, but I, I, told, I told someone else, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking about um, uh, Dr. Hill. You know, she has, uh, Dr. Hill has a, has a, a rising uh, singing star uh, that, that, that has her last name as a little mini me version of her and Sylvia. Um, you know, to be perfectly honest, children are far better, I think, at wearing that mask when they get into school. You know, they when we tell them to get in line, they get in line. If you tell them to keep their mask on, they keep their mask on. Okay. Adults, not so much. So, you know, we have to kind of think about, you know, what really may be happening from a public health standpoint and why children may or may not be the transmission uh, transmitters we thought they would have been in a, in a school setting. Dr. Hill, those are the questions that came in early through the email. Okay, well, I wanted to uh, kind of take a commercial break and just let everyone know that uh, I know many of you are excited about the presentation tonight and, and would like copies of it. And we actually will have the recording available. And so if you hadn't noticed in the chat, there's a link that you can go to ReachUp's YouTube channel and you can actually appreciate this presentation there. Um, so again, this is one of the things that ReachUp does so well um, for us is that they not only organize the meetings, but make sure that there's information available to the public after they've been presented. So I just wanted to kind of mention that. So um, Dr. Sneed, we all, you know, we've gotten this question quite a bit as well, because there's been information out there cautioning people that have allergies or certain autoimmune disorders, you know, to think twice about the vaccine. And so um, Ms. Cynthia Asia asks, what are the effects does it have on persons with lupus? 
Yeah, that's a very good question. You know, when we talk about lupus, uh, that's a very general, um, a very, uh, there's an array of different conditions people can have with lupus. And so number one, um, in, in every clinical trial, we did not enroll people specifically with lupus or autoimmune disorders. Um, but what I can tell you is I, I've gone around the world, or I've not traveled around the world, but I've looked around the world. And um, the rheumatological associations are now recommending that people that have an autoimmune uh, condition, they, they want them vaccinated. They're recommending that they get vaccinated. Now, the big danger is not will it do, what, what can the vaccine do to you because of your condition? The big question will be whether or not you, with your particular condition, can you actually build up the antibody response that we anticipate? And we, you know, I think we're still collecting data on that point. The general belief is you will, uh, but we also have to be con concerned about the other medications you may be on that actually may have an effect of, of diminishing the, the antibody production in your body. And so, uh, but, but right, right now, and, and, but the, the general recommendation would be to always go back to your rheumatologist. Uh, I don't want to usurp uh, their authority to, to be able to impart their information to you as a patient. But the rheumatological associations around the world are beginning to recommend, yes, we want people to get vaccinated uh, to try and give them an opportunity. Because I can tell you right now, you, if you have lupus, you already have a condition that can be uh, highly inflammatory, as you already know. And, get, and contracting the actual virus can actually turn on these inflammatory proteins even more. And so we want people to be vaccinated against it and try to, the best they can to build up an antibody army against being um, uh, infected by the virus. <clears throat> Very good. Excuse me. We've had a few of the participants this evening who've actually had the vaccine and they've commented on having either minimal side effects or no. It looks like um, Ms. Linda Palmer had the Pfizer vaccine and Mr. Lamont Hogan's also had the Pfizer vaccine and they had very few, if any, side effects. The mild headaches sore, uh, was what Mr. Hogan's actually experienced. And then Ms. Cynthia Smith commented that if the vaccine can't help if we don't get it and how frustrating it is um, for parishioners. But Mr. Douglas Walker was curious about how the general public can access the, some of the statistics that you showed in your presentation, Dr. Sneed. Uh, yeah, that, that information is readily available. Um, in the very beginning, when I was trying to get to it, I just went and Googled uh, Florida COVID vaccine statistics, and it popped right up. Uh, you can get that from the Department of Health. And um, I will tell you, uh, as we're moving along, I'll, 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 I'll put the link into the chat, and then you all can click on it from there, and, and you'll be able to get to it. I want you all to be able to follow it the same way I do. Uh, I will share with you, uh, there's a little bit of controversy when you look at the data, okay? Uh, again, part of the problem, and, and there's, a, there's three things I want to make about that data. So, um, uh, Douglas Walker, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to provide context to the data you're going to look at. Number one, there's a component of the data. Uh, again, we're only dealing with Florida right now. There's a component of the data that says unknown. OK, and I've been asking people all across the entire state of Florida, we don't know who is in the unknown category, but there's a large number of people in that category. But number two, when you look at the African-American number, even if you were to take a portion of the unknown and add it to the African-American category, we still find that there's a, a huge disparity in, in terms of the, uh, the number of people who have not gotten vaccinated. And so now there's a big discussion going on in the state of Florida between, on the one hand, one group saying, you know, uh, you know, people are having trouble having access to get the vaccine. Uh, you know, you shouldn't expect anyone, you know, 80 years old um, as African-American that may not even have Wi-Fi in their house to um, sit at a laptop that they may or may not have and try and hit, continue to hit enter to log into a portal to try and get an appointment to go drive somewhere to get a vaccine. Okay, so that becomes an access issue around, you know, people and where they live. On the other hand, you have people looking at the very same data and saying, well, clearly, you know, everyone has access to it. 
And that number happens to be very low because African Americans are very hesitant and don't want to get vaccinated. Now, remember, I've, I've got two people looking at the data and they're having, and, and without context, they're, they're having two wildly different uh, opinions about a couple of numbers on a, on, a, on a spreadsheet. And so myself and Dr. Hill, when we talked about it year, uh, years ago, it feels like years ago, doesn't it, Dr. Hill? When we talked about it weeks ago, we just, and myself and Dr. Austin, we just really decided that, you know what, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that people overcome their access issues and try and reach out through uh, organizations like Reach Up and a whole host of churches and other people and try to make sure that they have an opportunity to get vaccinated and try and improve that number. And and, uh, and I think what we're finding, and, I, and I'm very public about it, and I've, I've mentioned it in a number of interviews that I've given, uh, we're not finding people now being afraid of, to get the vaccine. Okay, so the hesitant part, I mean, there's still people out there, but that number is probably not nearly as high as we're giving it credit for. Uh, there's more uh, desire to get the vaccine than there is vaccine right now in, in African American and Latino communities. And, um, but on the other hand, you know, there are people, and I want to share a stat with you that, that startled me. Um, uh, even here in here in Florida, uh, somewhere between uh, 30 and 40 percent of, of um, first responders or uh, paramedics did not want to get vaccinated. Um, the number of people around the entire state of Florida that, that, that are nurses working in hospitals that did not want to get vaccinated. And I mean, there's a larger number of people that are involved in healthcare and really don't understand the messenger RNA technology. They don't understand that uh, we've been working on that technology now for an eight or nine year period, maybe even more. And, 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 and so, you know, we have to look at the, the numbers and context. And, and thank you, um, uh, uh, Douglas Walker, for asking that question and allowing me to provide context to you for the data that you're looking at. As a public health official, which I do qualify as, and, and myself and Dr. Hill, uh, we have to be very critical about how we evaluate data and then how we turn around and try to interact with the public about that data. And we want to do it in a very responsible manner. Uh, no finger pointing, no guessing. We want to get boots on the ground and try and figure out exactly what the problem is and then try and overcome the problem. In other words, we just want to fix it. We, uh, and, you know, and, and Pastor God, and I think you would agree with that. You and I had that conversation with Dr. Hill. what tonight was designed to get this critical and vital information and it's just the beginning because our strategy continues beyond tonight to figure yeah. out how to fix and how to give access yeah you know i have a question here from a mike mustard and i and, and i just want to go back to to the question that he had um on your slide about different coronaviruses you had number of years to the right um the number of years I had to the right, that was the number of years in between the time that and the one event occurred and the next event occurred. And what I was showing is that we went from we went from the original SARS to MERS. That took a 10 year period. And then we've now. And, and so that was on 2002 to 2012. Then we have gone from 2012 to 2019. That's a seven year period. Now, if we keep up that trajectory, okay, that means that we could be looking at another pandemic in a four to five year period if we just keep up the very same level. And by the way, I'm really concerned about it because, you know, the original COVID-19 jumped from animals into humans. But our failure to shut down transmission from human to human now means it is now learning our body. And that's where the mutations and the variants that you keep hearing about, that's what they're doing. They are learning our body and we keep transmitting and transmitting and transmitting and we allow more variants to occur. And, and it is far more easily uh, transmissible now than it had been even a year ago. So I appreciate the question very much. And, 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 um, and, it, and it does underscore, you're going to begin hearing a lot more about booster shots. Okay another vaccine or annual vaccine shots like we have with the flu. Um, very quickly, Dr. Hill, if you can allow me uh, just for another two minute answer here. Okay. 
the messenger RNA vaccines that you are encountering, that you're hearing about. And it, and it even applies now to the new one from Johnson & Johnson, but in a different mechanism. What they do, they actually get the genetic code of the particular virus and they take a portion of it and they flip that and turn it around into uh, uh, synthetic messenger RNA that they can produce in a laboratory. Now, that means that we are tailoring and personalizing at the highest level possible today a vaccine that can target that specific virus. So the variant right now, they are now building a vaccine right now today, even tonight, that will be matched up perfectly to that particular variant. And they only need, believe it or not, they only need a one month period to be able to turn around and get the genetic code and then begin to produce the vaccine. So the rapid deployment that we're talking about is exactly what the vision was when they began talking about messenger RNA technology. And now, the, now what I'm gonna tell you after that, when you inject the messenger RNA into your body, it's no different than when you have a computer code on your, on your, in your computer and you send the code to your printer. If you typed in the word vaccine and you hit enter and the code going from the computer to your printer, it's the very same thing we're doing with messenger RNA. When we inject it, it's now telling a printer inside of your cell called a ribosome to make the little red spike protein that you saw in that video. And then your body will recognize that red spike protein and begin to build antibodies and build a lot of them. And we can tailor, as long as we have that red spike protein genetic code, we can now tailor a vaccine to combat it. So please, you know, if you're talking to people when you get off here tonight, please share with them there's nothing more dangerous about the vaccine than if you were to encounter the actual virus that will now put that RNA into your body and begin to do really random things. We don't even know. We can't tell why some people don't have any problem at all. And then other people who are very healthy wind up in the ICU. Uh, we can't, we don't know how to predict yet who's going to have that, that problem. So we want people vaccinated. We need to get people vaccinated. Uh, next question. Um, and, and, uh, Dr. Uh, God, let, let me just make sure we're doing a time check. I'm here as long as people want to be here. But I just want to make sure, are, are, are we on your time or? or uh... We're good. We're good. We schedule until nine because I know that there will be lots of questions for you. Okay. okay so good. as long okay. as you're good, Dr. Sneed, we certainly are available to continue to respond to questions. We, we, we want to we want you to keep fighting for us, so we don't want to wear you out tonight. No, we'll hey, no, you know what? Um, <laughs> I, I've, got, I've got limitless energy for, 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 uh, for people in every community, and, and uh, Pastor God and I am at your disposal. Well, thank you, Dr. Dr. Sneed. And uh, I see there are some more questions that are coming up in the chat room. Um, so they're, they're, they're engaged. They okay, really are. Good. They're asking excellent questions. We also had a comment related to access um, and the impact on the Hispanic community attending church and all. So um, Mrs. Cynthia Smith, I wanted to ask if you didn't mind uh, me following up with you after tonight's meeting. I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about how we care perhaps can work with you and your church um, in terms of education and then um, certainly helping with the parishioners in that regard so that we can uh, hopefully help because we are concerned. We don't want you to lose parishioners, you know, in the process. Um, Dr. Sneed, you already addressed Mr. Uh, Mustard's question. Ms. Leveron was thanking you for the information, but Ms. Kathy Herschelman wanted to know how you felt about the new vaccines coming out, particularly the Johnson & Johnson and Novavax. And so would you like me to make the disclosure or would you like to do it? No, you, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let you do it first. Now. It'll be better okay. coming from you um, okay. yeah, before, okay. I, before I provide a very coherent answer for that. Okay. 
So the disclosure is simply that we're so fortunate. Um, Dr. Sneed uh, and I both have worked very diligently with all of the efforts on at USF to make sure that our patient base as well as faculty and, and students, you know, were protected with the vaccine. But more importantly, we wanted also the opportunity to have some of the trials come to the area. And so Dr. Sneed is actually one of the investigators for the Novavax vaccine. And so we are currently um, assisting and recruiting patients for that particular study. So you may hear from us um, beyond tonight's workshop as we continue to provide different aspects of information and education related not only to the pandemic, but also share with you insights um, as it relates to participating in studies. So that was the disclosure and I'll allow Dr. Sneed need to comment on the J&J &J as well as the Novavax uh, vaccine. Absolutely. Um, and what I'm doing right now, I, I, I put a link in there for people to be able to kind of get to. I couldn't find the other link quickly enough, but I did find that one. For you, for you to be able to get to a daily uh, and a, uh, a daily uh, stat sheet about vaccines across Florida. Um, let, me, let me first address one big issue. You're going to hear a lot of numbers and they're not going to make sense to you and they may erode your confidence in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. But let me be very clear about a couple of things. You're going to hear, you know, Moderna and Pfizer, they were 94 and 95 percent effective. And, and people are coming to me, my patients are coming to me and say, look, I don't want this other thing that's only 66 percent effective. If I can get 95% effective, and I say no, and I, and, I, and I take five minutes and I tell them, at the time that the Moderna and Pfizer clinical trials came out, number one, the variants were not out, okay? They were not out. That's number one. Johnson & Johnson, they were around when the variants were out. But more important than that, even if they weren't out for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, the two clinical, the two trials were looking at different outcomes, and it's very technical and it's very nuanced about. But they were looking at different things to assess whether or not it was really effective or not. And so Johnson and Johnson, they began looking at a, a, a myriad of uh, what about hospitalization, what about death. You know, what about this and what about that? What happened in the United States uh, versus South America? And they kind of took all that information and then you heard overall, you heard 66% coming out from overall, from the overall trial. And in America, we were at 72% here in the United States. We were at 85% reduction in hospitalization and 100% reduction in death. Now, that's a lot of numbers to keep in my mind, okay? But over here uh, with Moderna and Pfizer, we only heard 95%. So my recommendation for everybody, if you have, if you have an opportunity to get the one-shot Johnson & Johnson vaccine, you get it. Don't delay. It's a very effective vaccine, okay? It is really delivering, not in, not in the very same way, but delivering a similar um, RNA technology into your cell the way we are doing with um, Moderna and Pfizer. And you are going to build a very similar antibody to, to that. Now, let me share with you all, the Novavax is a little bit different. They actually are taking a little bit more traditional approach and they have found a way to grow that spike protein. And then they kind of, almost like you, almost like you grow uh, broccoli and they cut the broccoli head off. In this case, uh, they cut off the head of the, um, the little red spike protein and they put that into a shot and then they inject you with that. So you're actually getting protein as, a, as opposed to messenger RNA. So all very, very new technology all designed to be very uh, good at being deployed. So I want, I hope that will answer the question. Don't get hung up on 95 and 72%. That's not the way to think about it. They were apples and oranges, okay? Apples and oranges. It may not even be apples and oranges. It might be apples and vegetables, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. So, uh, 
Thank you for that question. So, Dr. Sneed, uh, could you also comment on assuring people that, you know, one of the myths we always hear about is that people are actually getting the virus. So when you say stuff like they're getting a piece of the protein or um, it's the messenger RNA, let's let's spend a little more time reassuring people that they're not getting infected with with Quran. <laughs> yeah, you know, the way that we have done vaccine development for years, I mean, for decades now that we would take a virus and we would begin growing it in chicken eggs okay and we would and they would go ahead and, and they would get a lot of that 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 virus and then they would put it into a chemical that would take the virus and chop it up and therefore they would kind of they would kill the virus and then they would take a little segment of the chopped up virus and they put it into a vaccine and then they would inject you with it and your body would say hey you know what i'm going to build an antibody to the foreign body that came into my body, and then if you came into contact with the actual virus from that little piece of, of, of dead virus that they put into your body, you would already have antibodies. There's no vaccine right now on the market that's doing anything with any live portion of the coronavirus at all. Again, um, messenger RNA, uh, and, and let me be very clear about messenger RNA. It does not interact with your DNA. It has no capability of interacting with your DNA. Uh, Dr. Hill and I, we, you know, we did a call with uh, people from Nigeria, Lagos, Nigeria, and that was a question that they were asking, or, or their patients were asking them. We were talking to healthcare providers. It will not alter your DNA. It does not interact with your DNA. It has no capability of doing that whatsoever. Okay, so you're not going to grow a, a, a third eye, or <laughs> as a matter of fact, when you injected with the with the um the vaccine that messenger rna is gone completely broken down from your body it eliminated from your body in less than a 24-hour period okay so it really has no capability of doing anything bad but you know but dr hill you're exactly right you're not being you know we didn't grow the coronavirus and chop it up and give you a portion of it we don't give you live virus the way other vaccines are we have given you brand new technology that kind of mimicked a code from the virus that your body would recognize and then build antibodies against. So transitioning a little bit, you know, there is concern about the fact that elderly patients are being prioritized for access to the vaccine, you know, and then second to that, healthcare workers. Um, and so there's a couple of questions, one asking about younger people and when do you think, you know, they'll be able to get vaccinated when they have comorbidities. And then we have individuals that may be 62 and they have a lot of comorbidities, but not quite 65, you know, and they're involved in different aspects of health care or service to the community, but probably don't fall in that category of an essential health worker necessarily or an essential worker. So any predictions that you, you have in regards to how we're going to make sure that people who are still being exposed to, uh, you know, other individuals are going to get it or we just have to watch and wait kind of? Yeah, um, I think, well, number one, I think we need to pay attention to how much production of vaccine is coming into the country. Um, the more vaccine we have into, coming into the country, then the more we're going to be able to give out. Eventually, there will be a tipping point where um, all the elderly people that want to get it will have gotten it. And then there will always be a number of people that no matter what you tell them, they're not going to get it. And then we will move on from that group and then we'll move on to the next group. And I think we should be advocating for teachers. Uh, I really, I, I do believe in that wholeheartedly. And we need to be advocating for our essential workers, okay? Uh, we really need to be advocating for them, no matter who they are, no matter what racial or, or other background you could define. Um, we, you know, we need to be doing that. Now, let me share with you uh, Moderna, and I do believe Pfizer right now, they have clinical trials ongoing. Um, the Moderna vaccine is approved down to uh, only for 18 and above. The Pfizer vaccine, because they had a few people get in that were unintended, they had a few people get in that were unintended, they actually had people down to 16 
and above. And, and, and part of the EUA went down to 16, but both companies right now, they, they kind of started at 18 and they're going backwards in three year increments. And they have clinical trials going on for people down to 15. And they have clinical trials going on for people down to 12 years of age right now. And there could be an, a, a chance, I, I don't want to predict, uh, we have to let the data be the data in enrollment and, and everything else, but there could be an opportunity that we may have an approval for the vaccine down as low as age 12 that could occur this fall. And, and, and when they do a clinical trial like that, what they're doing, they're trying to make sure they have the correct dose for people of that age. And then they wanna make sure they're gonna look at safety data. And they're gonna look at that safety data for a longer period of time. And so when, and, and, but when they get that, that safety data, they then bridge it onto the currently available data. And then that will shorten the amount of time with probably a few less people than the original clinical trial. And so I fully expect that in the fall that we're gonna have an approval for a vaccine uh, for children, at least down to 15, but possibly down to age 12. So, Dr. Snead, we also have uh, still a number of questions related to church attendance, singing in the choir, and I do want to just make a couple of comments and suggestions because there seems to be a lot of heartburn about parishioners commenting on, you know, maybe changing churches and stuff because we know that the choral singing is a draw um, in addition to our wonderful pastors uh, and other things that go on during the church service. Um, but I wanted to kind of offer a suggestion of some of the things you and I have seen as we've been interfacing with the community. And that is some churches have allowed for cross sections of their choir to provide um, singing. And if they're providing online services, they may, um, have the choir convened separately from the time that the major church service is taking place with appropriate or extra distancing. And we have seen, and I've read as much as 15 feet from the closest person in the audience um, with masks and, and, and things of that nature. And, and for some of your larger churches where you can really space out, but keep in mind, Dr. Sneed has said so many times, this virus travels the, through the air. And so we really are advocating, you know, no <laughs> singing if possible. Um, and that as much as we can kind of support the CDC guidelines. But one of the interesting questions that came up um, Pastor Austin, I think, asked was how can churches get involved in being vaccination centers? And so I was going to say to her as well, I would love, you know, a chance to talk to her afterwards and kind of share with her some of the things We Care has been involved in, um, but wanted you to comment on that as well, Dr. Sneed. Yeah, you know, um, I, I, did a, I did a talk um, for my fraternity uh, on Sunday, um, no, Saturday, Saturday afternoon. And um, and there was a big question about churches, and, and, and very often many, many, many churches are trying to put a bid in to be a vaccination location. And, and I get that completely. The problem with that would be we just don't have enough vaccine, number one, to get to all of the churches that, that, that want to provide it as a service to their community. Um, and, and, and here's a, here, a startling number. And... I haven't found out what we got last week, but for weeks now, the entire state of Florida has only been getting 250,000 doses for the entire state of Florida. Okay, now, let, me, let me repeat that. 250,000 doses for the entire state of Florida, and we're trying to vaccinate about 15 to 17 million people. And... and um, Again, I think the big, the bigger question is going to be number one, getting getting vaccine, and and at the risk of, of uh, being with my Christian brethren this evening, I'm gonna I'm gonna share again a, a kind of humorous moment that occurred uh, three weeks ago. Now, I was giving an interview to to a reporter, uh, not here in here in the Bay Area, but here in Florida at a, a big newspaper. I won't say where, and. Um, and we were talking about, you know, the outreach that we've done with a lot of churches here in the Tampa Bay area. And it's been a primary 
uh, goal. But then, you know, our, our We Care group, we, we kind of said, well, we're going to go the nonprofit route and not stay solely with the churches. And I told her, but unfortunately, everybody doesn't go to church. And then I thought about what I said, and I thought about how that could come across in a newspaper. And I said, look, uh, take that off the record. <laughs> I didn't want her to twist it around. Um, but, it, you know, but, but as I began talking about, you know, telling that joke a little bit more, it really did come out that, you know, you know very often we have healthy competitions between churches. And they're very healthy competitions. But then there are many churches out there that don't fall into the mainstream of anybody. And, and uh, when we when we brought together a, a grant, you know, 12 churches to, to vaccinate all of them, well, there were about 200 other churches that we didn't bring together. And so I'm, I'm advocating, again, for almost every church to be a, a vaccination location. I want that to occur with all of you. And the bigger question will be, can we get enough vaccine to really make it mean a difference? And, and uh, from a public health standpoint, um, you know, you want to get the biggest bang for your buck that you can. Now, I'm not a, I'm not a big over, overwhelming proponent for uh, the Biden administration plan of, of opening up every football stadium around the country and having, you know, you know, thousands of people drive through there. Um, because I think we need to try and get into the community where many of you are working. I, and, and, and so I'm advocating for mobile units to get directly into the locations and get to people that can't get out. To, uh, to get vaccinated, but clearly want to gain protection. And so there's a balance there. Um, so I, I would I would definitely have you all follow up with Dr. Hill and Dr. Austin, Deborah Austin. Um, uh, and, and hopefully we can find ways to continue to work together. And, and um, as we get more vaccine available, you know, we can make it, uh, hopefully we can kind of partner and advocate for that to occur. But, but right now, um, you know, we have 15 requests for 15 different churches wanting their own vaccine site. And uh, we had enough vaccine to get to one church location. Uh, and we did that about two weeks ago now at Revealing Truth. Um, so it just, you know, I, I do understand. And so, Dr. Snead, you know, to your point about not having enough vaccine, one question was, you know, some people are getting their first dose and you're always hearing about there being a shortage of supplies. Should they be concerned about getting the second dose? Are there opportunities to mix the different types of vaccines, you know, and then what are the ideal times for spacing the doses? And I'm okay, trying so, to just cover several questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, no, Dr. Hill, you're going to be, well, you, you may not be surprised by this answer. Um, a lot of people are worried, you know, we've been hearing people advocating for getting the first dose and giving, give everything away and, and, and try to get to the second dose when you can. Every clinical trial is not done that way, okay? And we have to go with what we know worked. However, I do believe, and I agree with Dr. Fauci completely, independent of him, by the way, that, you know, if you, if you, okay, so let me back up. If you got the Pfizer product, your, 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 your anticipated second dose should come at a three week interval after that. If you get Moderna, your anticipated interval will be four weeks after that. Now I agree with that. If you get to a point of even going about a six week time period after the first dose, I think even that would be okay. I really do. But keep in mind, number one, the first dose that you get is only going to confer about 50% protection, okay? Which overall to me is not enough to protect you against getting infected. And overall is not quite enough to really protect you against the variant. What we do need is for that really robust second dose to come in and kick up the antibody army. And by the way, when you do that, it will still work against the variant because, you know, it's going it to, it will still attach on to the red spike protein. It just might not cover the entire thing the way we thought it did, but it should cover two thirds of it at least. And that should be enough to protect people from becoming severely ill. And so, um, but Dr. Hill, let me tell you what's happening now. You know, before people were worried, you know, we were worrying that people weren't going to be able to get to a second dose. And, and we and the, and the CDC put out a guideline. It said in an extreme situation, 
even if you get Pfizer the first time, if you have a chance to get Moderna the second time, then take it or, or the opposite. What's beginning to happen is that people are getting the first dose and they're not showing up for the second dose. And we're beginning to have that happen. And now, now what that could do is set up a scenario where we're not getting full protection against the variant. And if you become infected, you may actually turn around and help continue the, the further variant and mutation production occurring because you don't have the full amount of antibody to then kill the virus within you and prevent you from transmitting, transmitting it to other people. And so we really want people, if you get Pfizer or Moderna, you should go back and get that second dose. Uh, if you, uh, moving forward, I, I, I believe the, the, uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine will be ready and available in about the middle of March, uh, a little bit more than a month from now. Uh, if you have an opportunity, you should go and get that. It's only one shot. But, uh, you know, we really are having more of a problem and capability of, of people showing up for the second dose because now we need to track them down and try and find a way to get them back to a location to get the second dose. And, and we do want to spend a little time talking about the variants, but before we get there, I wanted to address some of the um, safety measures people are taking, like we had several questions. Should we be double masking, triple masking? Um, should we wear protective eyewear? Uh, you know, and for those people who have gotten vaccinated, are they protected? And you kind of alluded to a lot of that, but should we be concerned about them still getting infected? And then I think, you know, obviously we have our special populations like pregnant women. You know, what advice do you have for them in relation to the vaccine? Yeah, uh, I, I, uh, Dr. Hill, if I forget, because you gave me a whole lot to remember there, uh, make sure I come back to the pregnant women because I want to spend a little bit of time there. Okay. Um, um, go back to the rules, the first part of that. <laughs> maybe I should maybe I should have gone with the pregnant women because I was I was, uh, I, was, I, was, I, was pu I was pulling the pregnant women data in my brain. So no, and every, everybody, I, I, and Dr. Hill, let me tell you, Dr. Hill is laughing at me. Uh, I, I do, you know, and this is not a pat on the back, Dr. Sneed moment, but I, I just want to share with you all, and this is an actual number. Uh, I have now uh, read probably 350 mm -hmm. peer-reviewed articles over the past year about COVID-19. Uh, I have read a lot. Uh, I read on the weekends. I read two, three, four articles. Uh, you know, during the week, if another one will come up. And so I have a lot of information floating around in my brain. So, um, and so, you know, when you brought up the pregnancy, I had to remember, oh yeah, you know, I was just reading about that. Let me pull that part of my, of my photographic memory out. And what was the first part again, Dr. Hill? Well, let me, let me uh, t give you time to work on it. So I was asking about precautions like double and triple mask, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. protective eyewear, yeah. and then I was transitioning into and special populations like pregnant women, and then let's get into the variants. <laughs> okay. Masking. Um, yeah, we do have a recommendation for double masking right now. Uh, but now let, let me let me be very clear. And, and again, I'm with a really good group of people here. Uh, you all are bright. I've had a chance to kind of scroll through and, and take a look at the people who are here tonight. And, and, um, and uh, you all are a beautiful group of people. I'm just really happy to be here and very blessed uh, to be here with you all this evening. Uh, I want you all to be reasonable, okay? If you wear a double mask, you must be able to breathe, okay? Uh, you, you, you must continue to be able to breathe. And, and, and I know it sounds funny, but we are now, we've gotten to a point, and, and I don't have my N95 around here but you know if you have a if you if you can get your hands on the n95 mask you should do it now make sure you it's an authentic one we have a lot of counterfeits coming on the market right now and i don't know how to tell you uh, there's a little code called niosh n-i-o-s-h niosh approved you should look for that and, and try the best you can but if you can get a, a kn95 or n95 uh, they happen to be a little bit better quality, number one. Number two, we are recommending double masking. So if you just have a regular surgical mask and then you have the other cloth mask on top of that, I think that would be enough to oxygenate you at an appropriate level as long as you're not trying to walk up five flights of stairs like I did this morning. You know, right when I got to like four and a half, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I'm going to make the other half. 
because I had, you know, Dr. Hill, I had uh, two two bags on both shoulders. I had a bag on this shoulder and that shoulder. And you know, I'm carrying 50 pounds up the stairs. I want you to breathe. So, but, but we are recommending, and the reason being, the variants, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment, the variants, they are much more easily transmittable than what we have, uh, what we have been encountering before. Okay, they are, and, and I'm going to talk about that. Number two, eyewear. I recommended when before we shut down a lot of the air travel. I was already recommending that people have eyewear. Oh, I've got a pair. Right, I've got my goggles right here for example. For an example, uh, these are my goggles. Okay. Now they actually have a rubber coating around here. Okay, so I, because I wanted extra protection when I go in the clinic and, and I was working, I was doing swabbing all summer. So eyewear. We have found cases where people actually became infected through the eye. <clears throat> and the reason we knew that because they developed a conjunctivitis, an itchy eye, and then they became ill after that. And we found that uh, early on in airports. Um, so you can't become infected in the eye. Now, be reasonable, you know, oh, by the way, if you happen to wear eye, eye glasses, we found those to be actually very protective as well, okay? So you don't have to go and get what I have if you already have a regular pair of eyeglasses. Uh, we found that to be protective. Um, but, you know, be reasonable. You know, if you're in a, in a fairly large open area walking through the mall, I don't think you'll be infected through the eye. I think you have to be fairly concentrated to be able to do that. Um, let's talk about the variance for a moment. Um, the variant, look, look, we've had mutations the entire time. Uh, viruses are always going to mutate. But let me explain a little bit more about this. You know, when we get the flu, you all get a new flu shot every year. Because you know what? That, that, that flu virus is only what we call 4,000 base pairs. It's about that long. The coronavirus is what we call 30,000 base pairs. It's, it's about that long. And so it, it's going to change a little bit less rapidly than, than the flu will. And early on, we called it a stable virus. Now, having said that, viruses are going to mutate. They're going to, they will adjust. I had a very long discussion this morning when I was in clinic with one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Eddie Gonzalez. And, uh, you know, I began talking about potential environmental factors, nothing published, but, you know, just, a, just a, an opinion. But, you know, I said, what if there's a particular drinking water down in South Africa that you don't find or the people were drinking a particular kind of beer in the, in the United Kingdom? Or what if there was something else going on down in Brazil that really kind of led to the type of mutation that happened geographically around the world? We don't know that, but I'm wondering. It's a question in my mind. And so the, the different when we talk about a variant, what we're really talking about now is the fact that it has come into the body and it's now learning different ways and it's mutating and it will change a little protein here and there and it will uh, and what it has learned is how to more effectively stick on to that receptor and it gains entry into your cell a little bit quicker than it did before and a little bit more efficiently and if it does that that means it can replicate a little bit faster which means it has a little bit more coming out which means you have the capability of transmitting it a little bit easier than you did before. And so the variants really are about protein mutations that are occurring. And very often, most of the changes are, are, so, are meaningless. Okay, they don't mean anything at all. They, they happen by mistake. But there are times that we are now finding, and Dr. Hill, I read an article the other day. On, it was a long article. I should share it with you. I began talking about how when they did a study where they gave patients uh, the convalescent plasma from people who had already been infected mm -hmm. and how it actually kind of selected out a particular mutation in this patient mm -hmm. uh, who had been in the hospital for a 57 day period. And, and I thought, Oh my gosh. And the more I read the article it really kind of awakened a lot of possibilities. And I said, you know, we got to vaccinate people as quickly as we can. And if you cannot be one of the you know, fortunate people to get to a vaccine, a vaccine early enough, we need you to double mask and try not to transmit. If we had everybody in America wear a mask, we could actually shut this whole thing down 
probably in about a four week period. It, would, it could almost be done and over with. We have not had the discipline to be able to do that. So uh, uh, let me let me move over to uh, pregnancy. Before you do that, Dr. Sneed, yeah. someone commented, and I do think this is a, a good um, segue too, um, because we're even seeing it on TV where people are wearing the face shields. And we need to give some, some advice in relation to what opportunities, but then limits that the face shields have compared to, you know, masking and, and what should be protocol. <clears throat> Yeah, you know, you know, face shields on to me, they don't offer the full protection if that's all you're wearing. I think you need to wear a mask under there because, you know, you can still have air movement under the face shield. Now, the face shield is very good if you're going to be, if you're a healthcare worker and you're trying to protect against the potential projectile, um, uh, projectile uh, virus release from a patient. Uh, I think face shields are very uh, effective and efficient and, and a nicely used set. Uh, but if you pay attention, unless they have a really fancy one that covers here and it has a little hole, like a vacuum hose, an air hose to help them breathe, anytime they have a face shield, they have an N95 mask under the face shield. Everybody's wearing a mask under all healthcare providers. So the face shield is not going to provide you with all the protection you think it, it will. Uh, it just won't. Uh, you need to wear a mask under the face shield because the air movement potentially going on through that face shield is very high. Uh, does that answer that question, Dr. Hill? Yes, I, I just really wanted you to, to make sure we yeah. the so eye wear the eye, the eye wear is going to be very good to protect your eyes. But when I'm in clinic um, and we have a policy, you have to have eye wear or the face shield, but you cannot, you have to have a mask on with everything. So you can't you can't just have a face shield and not have anything underneath that. Um, I don't think that's a very effective uh, effective enough barrier to protect you, or even protect other people from you. To be perfectly honest. Okay. Well, yeah, uh, let's talk about the pregnant women. Yes. <laughs> pregnancy. Yeah, you know, um, let, let me and, and we need to be very clear because you know something was going around the internet that the, the vaccines were going to cause infertility and. And, you know, many women were really concerned about that. And the one thing I can tell you, number one, I have not read anything anywhere that would support anything along that, that line. But what I can tell you that I have read, I've read both the 53-page report from Moderna that went to the FDA, and I read the 52-page report from Pfizer that went to the FDA. And, and when the Pfizer product came out, they did not enroll anybody that was pregnant at the time they enrolled people into the trial. And then at, you know, at enrollment, that's when you get your first shot. But during, and now when you enroll in the clinical trial, you're enrolled for a two year period. They're going to monitor you for two years. You, know, you don't just get the shot one or two times and then you're never part of it again. During the trial period, a number of women became pregnant. Okay. And they began tracking them along the way. They wanted to know. They had a question. We need to pay particular attention to the pregnant woman that got our vaccine. And so the notion of infertility uh, is just not supported, even by the fact that women became pregnant during the clinical trial and gave people an opportunity to pay attention to it, number one. Number two, the mess messenger RNA Again, intimately safe, doesn't really inter interact with anyth anything that we can really tell right now. However, a recommendation is now coming out from the OBGYN societies that if, you, if your OB feels that you are uh, at high risk, okay, as a pregnant woman, that they are going to recommend you get vaccinated, okay? And, and we want to push you back to your OB and have that conversation with them. But but there are there is a recommendation now that if you fall if they feel you fall into a high risk category, if you happen to be one that has uh, gestational diabetes, for example, okay, or other conditions that they feel are high risk, they may make that recommendation to you because the risk of being infected with the actual virus as you are pregnant is greater than the risk of getting the vaccine. And so, and that, and that again, is supported on, on, on multiple, you can go to, um, 
If you uh, type in ACOG, uh, ACOG, um, if you go there, uh, that, that's the big OB society uh, here in America. Uh, I do believe it, it might be on the CDC website even right now. Uh, you can find information about pregnancy and 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 uh, and, and the vaccine, uh, the currently available vaccine. I have not seen any data at all. I want to be very clear. I have not read any data about any pregnancy with the Johnson & Johnson product, but I will have an opportunity to read that on February 23rd. On February 23rd, Dr. Hill, I'm going to download that report and I'm going to start reading and highlight, okay, from the FDA, uh, uh, from this submission to the FDA. So that's my best answer I can give about that. But if you have any question and you have a specialist, I'll always go back and talk with them about your condition and whether or not that individual, she or he, is feeling more comfortable about your, uh, your ability to get vaccinated. And that goes for both rheumatologists uh, with autoimmune conditions and pregnancy for um, and pregnancy for, for pregnant women with OBs. Thank you, Dr. Sneed. So uh, we also had uh, some questions relating to quarantining. So I wanted to give a scenario. You know, I shared with you my brother was infected, ended up in the hospital in the ICU unit. Thanks to God, he survived, but his wife and my niece, who were all in the same household with two other nieces, um, also were infected. And so um, the question is in relation to quarantining, when you have that occur where one person is infected, should the whole household quarantine anyway? Um, and or what are your thoughts? And particularly, this may be an opportunity as well to touch on herd immunity and whether or not natural immunity versus, you know, people getting vaccinated and us building herd immunity that way can come up. Um, Dr. Hill, repeat that because I, I, got, a, I got a message here. Okay. Um, and uh, you know what? Is Candace Lewis on? Candace Lewis. Dr. Lewis. Dr. Lewis. Okay, maybe she's not on. Okay, let me see if she can. Okay. Dr. Okay. Hill, repeat that question, please. I, I was reading it and I said, oh my goodness. What, <laughs> the, world, the, world is, the world is small. So, um, so basically, I was commenting on quarantining. Yes, in the I, yeah, I heard, yeah, about your, your brother. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I apologize sincerely from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> That's okay. I really do. Yeah. But I'm looking at you. I know. <laughs> so I'm paying attention. All right. So with the quarantining, when one person is infected, should the whole household uh, quarantine also? Or I was thinking that this would be a good opportunity to touch on herd immunity versus natural immunity and what what advice you had regarding that. Yeah, you know, part of the problem and challenge uh, when, when we come into contact um, with an infected individual, we don't know if other people have been affected. Uh, we don't know if they actually may be, um, uh, you could be infected and be in asymptomatic areas. So we do recommend, uh, you know, we would probably recommend quarantining of the entire household. Uh, you know, in schools right now, uh, for individuals that are, are part of our team units, if one person on the team uh, actually becomes infected through contact tracing, they're going to recommend a number of people actually go in quarantine. Uh, the current recommendation is that people kind of, um, isolate for about a 10 day period. Um, you know, here we still recommend 14 days, but the, the CDC recommendation uh, came out of 10 days, so 10 to 14 days after that. And um, and I want to share with all of you, and Dr. Hill has heard me mention on many occasions now, uh, I had a family of four, um, only one person in my clinic, but four people in the household were infected. And all four people had a different symptom. Okay, not all four people had something different happen to them with one hospitalization. And so um, I think it shows the variability all the way from being an asymptomatic carrier, all the way to, as Dr. Hill mentioned with her own family, uh, all the way to potentially winding up in the hospital. Uh, from a, a standpoint of herd immunity, the whole notion of herd immunity comes in the fact that if you have a, a, an entire group of people, if you can get them all vaccinated, 
if you can get the majority vaccinated. So let's say we had 100 people. If we can get 80 people vaccinated, we feel that that might be enough to then protect the 20 people that probably did not have an opportunity to get vaccinated, okay? Because the, the ability to, to then transmit from one person to another has been significantly shut down. Now, the fallacy that we had last year uh, with the, the natural herd immunity where, you know, we had um, certain individuals on, on the task force that were advocating for the fact that we should just let the, 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 what we call the wild type virus, the original virus, just run rampant through the entire population across America. And then we would vaccinate and get to herd immunity that way. And, and the general feeling had been, well, once you become infected, that's kind of like getting uh, getting vaccinated. Well, again, the problem with that, number one, the estimation was that we were going to wind up killing up to 6 million people to achieve that. And nobody would want that. But then number two, we allow greater mutation of the wild type virus to occur. And that's exactly what we've been witnessing right now, by the way, without letting it run rampant across the entire country. So we don't want natural immunity uh, with an RNA-based virus. Um, and, and, and well, I'm not going to get into RNA and DNA viruses, but uh, with RNA viruses, we don't want that to occur. We want people protected. We want people vaccinated so that we can uh, achieve herd immunity by the fact that you have natural antibodies in your body from the vaccine and not antibodies because you became infected with the actual virus. We don't want that little RNA strand in your body. You don't want that. Trust me. You don't want it. From day one, I knew I didn't want it. I don't want it now. I mean, I'm, I've been vaccinated now for a month or more, and I'm wearing a mask everywhere. I don't want to take the chance, okay? I would not take a chance. So, um, uh, Dr. Hill, I think that will answer that question about the herd immunity and uh, we want the majority, if we can get about 70 or 80% of the country vaccinated, we feel that that will be enough to shut down further transmission from one individual to another, one community to another, travel. It's going to be years, by the way, before we get uh, people enough vac vaccine around the, the world to be able to shut down uh, what we're talking about. So, you know, that's another health equity moment for, you know, developing countries and and a uh, country that, that don't have the resources that we have here in the United States. So I'm a big fan of COVAX right now, to be perfectly honest. Thank you, uh, Dr. C. Dr. Hill, I think we can take maybe two more questions and prepare. Oh, yeah, look at that. Time flies, you know. I was going to say, we're getting close to time. So um, the two questions that I wanted to have Dr. Snead kind of address, one was um, a little bit more discussion about the layers in a mask, you know, because you can uh, double mask. And we've been hearing about people using things like coffee filters or, you know, certainly the changes in terms of the different layers and material. Then the second question is in relation to uh, the fact that you know, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines were approved on emergency use basis, and J&J &J is going down that same route. But do we expect full FDA approval, you know, one, in that we have other vaccines available on the market, and um, as as we're investigating the future ones, because we have so many out there that are being investigated, you know, what can we expect? Because I think people still have a little squeamishness about you know the fact that they have this emergency use approval despite the fact that you know you're telling them we've been studying the technology for a while yeah i think yeah i think these are two good ways to end everything up and before i go any further again i just want to thank pastor goddard for for uh, inviting me to come and share information uh anything i've shared tonight uh, you should be able to find it in, in something peer-reviewed um uh, um, somewhere. Uh, everything I've given has been evidence-based, so I just wanted to share that. Um, about the masking right now, uh, the current recommendation, they want, a three, they want three layers, but they want the three layers to actually be, you know, pretty tight-knit uh, material, okay, tight-knit tight -knit material. Um, what we don't want, by the way, and, and I, get, I get really frustrated when I, when I see it, you know, people have these gators, Okay, and we see them, you know, gators are really good. I, I've, I've been wearing a gator for years when I do yard work. 
because you know if you kick up a little bit of dust, no, it's good not to have to have to inhale all of that dirt. Gators do nothing at all to prevent that little tiny virus from coming out and being transmitted. And I see we have uh, I think it was Cynthia mm-hmm. Smith. Mm-hmm. Was that was that? Yes. Cynthia. Cynthia. Cynthia Smith has been a big advocate tonight for FAU. Yes, she uh, has. Yeah, she's been a big advocate. So let me just share with you all. Uh, at FAU, one of their scientists uh, was, was among the first to be able to show the effectiveness of masks and, and, and experimentation with masks and, and, and showing how much vapor coming from your mouth can come out through uh, improperly uh, manufactured masks. Okay? And so the gators are not good enough. Um, when we hear about you know, coffee filters, I've actually been okay with that because if you double fold a, a coffee a coffee filter, you can still breathe. And I think that that's been enough material to kind of stop that vapor from getting through. And I think that's been shown, but you have to insert it into another mask. Okay, so coffee filters either two or folded over appropriately are probably going to be good enough. Uh, the best the best thing to do. And I forget the, the name of the material, but they have a, they have another kind of material that people are now making with masks that really does stop that as well. So if you have a mask and you have an insert, you're probably going to be good enough, but it needs to be a minimum three layers. And and the surgical mask is just right at that that, that, that thread count that we want. But even, a, even that would not be enough to qualify, I think, for the double masking that we want. So... Uh, when you double mask, if you have a surgical mask, you want to put probably one of your kind of more colorful FAU mask or USF mask or or something along those lines on top of that, you know, or, or a Buccaneer mask. Um, you know, you want something along those lines. Um, now to uh, what was the second part, Dr. Hill? The second question was regarding the full FDA approval of our yeah, mask. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. 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 An this is a great, yeah, great way to finish out the evening to help everybody understand clinical research a little bit better and why we were able to move so quickly with what we're doing. When you, uh, anytime you do a vaccine trial, or what? Well, I shouldn't say anytime. What the, the demand from the FDA was that from the final moment when you do what we call your safety study, and the final individual that you enroll in that part of your trial. You must now observe that individual and everybody that came before them, but the very last individual, you have to observe them for a two month period. Because overwhelmingly, when they went back and reviewed any any real side effect that might occur from the vaccine typically occurred within a 60 day period. And so they said, we're not going to don't even come back and, and talk to us until you have data on a two month period beyond the, the final people that you enroll in your trial. Now, the fact that we are in a pandemic, okay, we have millions, I mean, tens of millions of people all around the world that were being affected mean, it meant that we now could enroll uh, 30,000 people in a trial, 45,000 people in another trial, another 30,000 people in the trial, we've been able to enroll you know, multiples of tens of thousands of people in clinical trials because we had such a high prevalence of, of, of the coronavirus around the world. That's very, very uncommon to be able to do it. And, the, and, the, and because we were in a pandemic and we had so many people, that meant that we actually had a reasonable expectation to figure out that if you got the placebo during the clinical trial, they measured, they had a set number of people that, you know, that, that would trigger. They said, you know, when you get to 90, 94 people, kind of making up a number, but not too far off. When you get to 94 people in your trial who have become infected with coronavirus, we're going to halt the trial right there. And we're going to unblind those 94 people. We're going to figure out how many people got the actual vaccine and how many people got the placebo. And every trial has been triggered that way. To, when you get to a number of people infected, um, they would they would kind of halt the trial, and then they would look at the, those people. And that's where we got the ninety, the ninety four and ninety five percent from Moderna, and and all the percentages I mentioned with um, with Johnson and Johnson. So 
the whole idea right now about the EUA is such that the actual clinical trial, the phase three portion of the trial is still ongoing because they have other endpoints they're looking to achieve. But what, what, the, what they needed for the emergency use was safety data and efficacy data. They want to know, was it, was it safe? And did it achieve everything you wanted it to achieve? I mean, what if we injected people with a vaccine, but you didn't build any antibodies? Or what if we did inject people with the vaccine and a bunch of people had a side effect? Well, neither one occurred. And, and, and so when you can show that kind of safety data on two parts, and, they, and we have an ongoing pandemic or an ongoing problem, they, they, they submit for an emergency use authorization. But when you take a look, the Moderna trial had 30,000 people in it. The, uh, uh, yeah, the Pfizer trial had 45,000 people in it. And they submitted the safety data on 98 to 99% of all those people in those trials. So we had 75,000 people that we were looking at from, in terms of data. And they were kind of reporting periodically along the way what they were finding in the trial in terms of safety. So don't get, don't get caught up on the EUA. The, the, the clinical trial is ongoing, but they have other endpoints they're going to be trying to achieve. There will come a day where the phase three portion will be completed, and they'll submit that data, and the FDA will review it. And and and, and there has been no indicator that there's any, any safety problem. There's been no indicator that, that there's, there's a loss of efficacy problem. And so they're going to get, they will achieve getting the full FDA approval. But they've already achieved 90, you know, figuratively well more than 90 to 95% of everything they need to do to show that they have efficacy and safety. And one more thing, I keep hearing people ask me all the time about the Bell's palsy. You know, is it going to give you Bell's palsy? Uh, let me just assure you, um, I read the report. I had never heard of anyone having Bell's palsy until I read the FDA report. And it was kind of down on page, I don't know, like 48. And I'm like, you know, but the number of people, the total number of people that got Bell's palsy in the trial were like seven people. Number one, all of them recovered. And number two, it did not occur at any rate higher than what we would have expected for the general population. And I hate to pick on dentists. I really do because I, I love dentists. Uh, but, you know, you can go in and get a root canal and that might be enough to actually cause you to get Bell's palsy or... You might have a really high stress environment or other. There are a lot of things that can cause Bell's palsy. It doesn't mean the vaccine. And by now that we've vaccinated, you know, what, 30 million people here in our country, we're not having widespread reports of anything about Bell's palsy or anything coming out or any other problem, really. Now, a few people are going to have a problem, but they're going to be the, the, the rarity. Uh, so don't get hung up on that. And again, nothing more dangerous than getting infected by this particular virus. Um, I, I can't, I cannot stress that enough. Oh, by the way, the two, two Moderna, Pfizer, they have no preservatives in them whatsoever, by the way. None whatsoever. That's why we have to keep them in such cold temperatures. So I'm going to pause right there. Uh, Dr. Hill, we're going to let, um, we're going to let Pastor God to kind of, kind of uh, take us out. I would love to have a prayer from from uh, anybody on here. Um, and Dr. Really Austin, worthy. yes, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sneed, and certainly for all the participants tonight. We are just so blessed and honored to have you and for you, this wonderful team to uh, support you with this presentation. And uh, our very own uh, Dr. Sharon Austin is going to extend uh, her greetings on behalf of our bishop and uh, share with us a benediction this evening. Thank you so much, Pastor Goddard. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Sneed, Dr. Hill, Dr. Austin, Dr. Green. Uh, just an amazing evening. We are grateful for your knowledge uh, and for your generosity of time and energy uh, to, to have led us in the way that you did uh, uh, for two hours at the end of a long day it is uh, remarkable. Uh, and we, we truly are grateful to you and, and could not compensate you for all we received uh, this evening. 
Uh, Dr. Sneed, on a personal note, I'm supposed to share with you that you will hear from Dr. Candace Lewis. Uh, she will call you and your wife this week. You see, in, in, in my role as director of Connectional Ministry, I'm all about the connection, so I just want to pass that on. Very good. Um, also, I want to thank uh, our Gulf Central District and conference staff, uh, Beth Potter, Mary, uh, Maggie Corrigan, Lori Hoffs, Brittany Jackson, and Steve Lohr, uh, for the work they do in helping us to get the word out and to help with registration and so forth and so on. And so it truly takes a village and we're glad to have uh, this village. And to our Pastor Goddard, once again, for uh, your leadership and for your willingness and for seeing this vision and seeing it through to reality. Uh, we're grateful to you and for all of you who have signed on to be with us this evening. Uh, and so as we conclude our time together, uh, I just invite us to bow our heads for uh, a brief prayer. Gracious and eternal God, we thank you for the fellowship and time we've enjoyed together. We're grateful for those who came to lead us and to speak to us. Uh, and we ask you to remind us uh, that um, all of your good gifts, let us include uh, our gratitude for your gift of science and for medicine and for the ways in which it helps uh, to improve the quality of our lives. Uh, we pray for a time when your good gifts will be available and accessible to all of your children, regardless of hue and strife and uh, location and economy. Uh, because we truly do believe in our hearts uh, the words uh, that you have shared with us, that you came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And so now give us restful slumber wherever we are and maybe wake on tomorrow uh, more committed than ever before to do your bidding in all the world. With this we say good night and be blessed and amen. 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 Thank you so very much again for everyone's participation. Be safe and stay well. And let's get vaccinated and spread the word and take someone with us when they're able to go. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Sneed. Thank you very Thank much you for the invitation. Good night. Good night. Good night.